Hardly a day will go by where you don't hear something about climate change. Climate change is easily the biggest story in the news this year, and for good reason. It attracts a lot of attention to different Facebook pages and websites and blogs. Scientific organizations like NASA have Facebook pages. NOAA is on there as well. Everyone is talking about climate change. But one has to wonder, do all of these sites exist just to convey information, or are some of them just grandstanding to get viewers to click on advertising links? This fervor for attention has created an environment of alarmism where people are trying to outdo each other and one-up each other with ever-growing doom and gloom predictions. Bill Nye the Science Guy! Bill Nye. By the end of this century, if emissions keep rising, the average temperature on Earth could go up another four to eight degrees. What I'm saying is the planet's on fucking fire. There are a lot of things we could do to put it out. Are any of them free? No, of course not. Nothing's free, you idiots. Grow the fuck up. There are a lot of noble reasons to talk about climate change and the environment, and there are a lot of selfish reasons to talk about climate change and the environment. It seems like everyone is finding a way to capitalize on global climate change, and one really does have to ask, what in the world does art have to do with climate change? How is someone selling paintings helping the environment in any form or fashion? They can try and say that they're educating people, but I think we're getting plenty of information about climate change. We're bombarded with it daily, and the last thing we need is people trying to seem like heroes because they're labeling their artwork as climate change artwork when it wouldn't have been noticed otherwise. This film is not meant to convey a scientific opinion on climate change, but rather its purpose is to question some of the conjecture around anthropogenic climate change. Most climate change discussions deal with future predictions, not on current observable measurements that were predicted in the past and how they tie into a predetermined model. The skeptical side of the climate change debate is not debating whether climates change over time. In grade school, we're taught that the Earth changes over the course of many millions of years. And in this example, what was once a lush forest is now a desert. And the ancient forest is only evidenced by the petrified tree trunks which still remain. In this other example, a melting glacier revealed an ancient forest which is still standing. This problem has reached a new stage in its development. A scientific consensus has emerged, and now the debate is over how long before the first effects will actually be felt. One of the most common talking points among climate change alarmists is the claim that 97% of scientists agree that human beings are primarily responsible for climate change. I was curious to find how that number was arrived at. And so I did a basic search and found a Wikipedia article that lists the surveys that are cited as the basis for that claim. I have to say that I was somewhat surprised at how flimsy the evidence for this consensus is. Either people who make the claim don't know the methodology used, or they don't understand statistics, or they're blatantly intellectually dishonest. Because when we look at the studies, we're going to find that there are glaring problems with the methodology, especially those who understand statistics will be able to relate. The most famous literature review was a survey of the published articles by John Cook et al. in 2013. And what they did was they examined 11,944 abstracts from peer-reviewed scientific literature from the date ranges of 1991 to 2011. The article clearly states that they found that while 66.4% of all of the papers had no position at all on anthropogenic global warming, of those that did, 97% endorsed the consensus position that humans are responsible for global warming. So right there we have a statistical problem in the fact that they're only claiming 97% out of 35.5% of the papers that were reviewed. That is hardly a consensus, and it gets worse. Basically, they ignored 8,000 of the papers in order to arrive at the consensus. I came across more than one study that had a fundamental statistical problem. In the Doran and Kendall Zimmerman 2009 paper, they put together a poll and they received replies from 3,100 out of 10,000 
earth scientists that they polled. So basically they concluded that 90% agreed that temperatures had generally risen and 82% agreed that humans had been significantly responsible for that. And the problem here is that you can't extrapolate the results from that because what happens is that's a voluntary poll and anytime you have a voluntary poll like when a news channel invites people to call in with their opinion on an issue there's always the disclaimer that it's not a scientific poll and the reason is a statistical term called bias and what bias is is where there's a flaw in the methodology for example if we wanted to take a poll and find out what percentage of the American population is in favor of building the wall between Mexico and the United States, you would get very different results if you had Fox News conduct an invitation poll where people were invited to call in versus Telemundo conducting the same poll. The proper way to conduct that study would be to randomly survey a large number of the population of the United States. And what random means is that everyone has an equal chance of being selected for the poll. And if they don't answer the poll, you have to randomly pick somebody else. So you can't take a fixed population and by invitation invite an opinion on an issue because that study would be tarnished by the possibility that those responding to the survey either feel strongly about the issue, whereas the other ones either don't want to participate because they don't agree with the issue or because they don't want to take a position on the issue. So any poll that's claiming that they have a 90% or better consensus based on 30% and even as bad as 18% in some studies of a response rate are scientifically invalid. One of the ways that alarmists avoid debating the issue is by criticizing the credentials of somebody who's asking them a difficult question. You don't need a science degree to point out a logical fallacy. And a one-day seminar with Al Gore certainly doesn't make you an expert on climatology. But yet somebody who is a scientist with a degree is ridiculed if they have a differing opinion. As a result of my analyses that challenge IPCC conclusions, I have been called a denier by other climate scientists and most recently by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Science is actually a jury system and if you think of how scientific ideas are accepted, it's only through the process of intense debate and scrutiny, just like a courtroom. I'm not questioning science, I'm not challenging science, I'm not putting forth my own theory but I will point out that the conjecture and the predictive theory did not come true, just so that people know where I'm coming from. My degree is in information systems, and that is a Bachelor of Science, and yes, it is in the College of Business. Being a science degree, it did require me to take scientific electives. My electives were biology, geology, world health, oceanography, and environmental science, which most definitely did encompass climatology. As a business science major, I also had to take statistics as well as calculus. I also took flying lessons, so I had to learn meteorology. People can try to criticize that all they want. That's just how it boils down. Computer models that successfully explain the climates of other planets predict the deaths of forests, parched croplands, the flooding of coastal cities, environmental refugees, widespread disaster. Finally, a federal report today predicted possible catastrophic... My generation grew Earth up being told over and over again that we were going to face rising sea levels, that were going to swallow cities whole, that polar bears were going to be extinct, that hurricanes were going to increase in frequency and intensity. Let's look at some of these predictions. 2018 was a rough year for climate alarmists. The Maldives were supposed to be underwater by then, and it was actually published 30 years ago that this was a certainty. And the government of the Maldives was even making plans to eventually evacuate the islands. However, nowadays, there's no such plan anymore. And in fact, the Maldives are thriving, and they have a bustling tourism industry with no sign of any impending doom.
Another well-documented example of islands that didn't need to be evacuated are the Carteret Islands, which are part of Papua New Guinea. In 2008, the International Organization for Migration published an article where they discussed the 2005 plan to evacuate the entire population of the atoll. I was curious to see how it all turned out, so I looked the islands up on Wikipedia, and I learned that since the 80s they had been considering evacuating and even started evacuating some families, and many of the families actually returned home. In 2017, the Finnish embassy, which was helping with the aid project, reported that there were more people than ever living on the atoll, and in fact the population had basically doubled. These examples were just part of a larger prediction made by the UN in its initial IPCC reports where they were predicting climate change refugees. Specifically in 2005, the United Nations Environmental Program predicted that climate change would create 50 million refugees by 2010. And they even had a map showing areas that were at risk. Unfortunately for the UN, 2010 came and went, and they've had to retract a lot of those predictions. These claims were given attention in the mass media. In 2008, scientists were quoted in the Telegraph as predicting refugees would be fleeing to Antarctica. Just nine years after the Telegraph carried the article, they decided that they were going to go the other route. The Telegraph posted that climate change wasn't as threatening as they had originally thought. The climate change alarmists are still trying to perpetuate the myth that storms are increasing and property damage is increasing. In this slide that was just shown on television the other day, it's alleged that there's more named storms now than there were before. Well, that's interesting, but it's not statistically significant. For one thing, we only have a data set of four samples, the decades of the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and 2010s. And statistically, it would be interesting if we had a larger sample size or we knew what the supposed normal level was. Because from this, we don't know if 149 is how many we're supposed to have or is 93 how many we're supposed to have. Are the 80s a low year or are the 2010s a high year? And how does it correlate to prior decades? We only had satellites from the 60s onwards. So everything from before the 60s is very subjective as far as trying to measure whether or not storm activity has increased. But we can determine how many storms hit the United States and what their intensity was, and we have very good records on that. Here we have a graph that shows what's been going on with the Atlantic hurricane season since 2005. The highs and the lows can easily be averaged out, and it's not particularly alarming. But what is interesting is, are hurricanes getting worse? According to data that was reported in the New York Post in 2018, for the United States, a trend of all landfalling hurricanes has been falling since 1900. In a great example of cherry picking, this graph shows that hurricane activity has actually been increasing. But notice the date range, 1970 to 2008. When the graph covers a larger date range, a downward trend since 1900 confirms the New York Post article. The graph ends at 2004, but what happened after that doesn't support the alarmist claim. 2005 was the most active Atlantic hurricane season on record. It's then followed by a 10-year gap which is the longest period for the U.S. to avoid a Category 3 or higher hurricane since reliable records began in 1850. So I think we can say definitively that hurricanes are not increasing in strength or hitting the United States more frequently. This screenshot purports to show how property damage has increased since the 80s. And one thing to note about that is while they did disclose that numbers are adjusted for inflation, most of the damage in a hurricane is the loss of a house or a structure. And coastal property did not keep pace with inflation. It actually outpaced it. So a house in the 1980s is going to cost at least three or four times as much in the 2010s as it did in the 80s. I can even use my own house in Florida as an example. My parents bought our old house in 
1980 for $100,000 and it's currently worth right around $400,000. And other areas like San Diego and San Francisco, houses cost well over six or ten times what they cost in the 80s. And the level of inflation is very low. From the 80s to the 90s, there was some inflation. But from the 90s onward, inflation in the United States has been very modest. Inflation has basically made most things cost about 150% more since the 90s, and house appreciation is not part of inflation. In fact, one could argue that low interest rates are the cause of property damage increasing versus climate change, because it's low interest rates that have actually made house prices balloon as more people can afford larger loans at lower interest rates. By the year 2000, the polar bear had become a bit of an icon to the climate change alarmist movement. Al Gore spoke about polar bears in his film An Inconvenient Truth, where he predicted their eventual demise. Basically, he was saying that they would drown if the ice melted. Well, those predictions fell far short because in the 1970s, there were estimated to be five to 10,000 polar bears, with estimates as high as 12,000. And nowadays, that estimate has now gone to between 20 and 30,000 polar bears, with the general accepted number around 25,000. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com so podcast. I've been following the global warming thing for about 40 years, so decade after decade we get these predictions. You know, Al Gore said the Arctic was going to be ice-free in 2014. Um, NASA's Jay Zwally said it was going to be ice-free in 2012. James Hansen said it would be ice-free sometime between 2013 and 2018. None of these predictions are coming true. The New York Times had a story a few years ago titled The End of Snow. Um, oh, like the independent one. The yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Snowfalls are now just a thing of a past. That yeah. was from the year 2000. Mm. Um, I was just looking at a story from The Guardian from 2012 this morning. Drought is the new norm for the UK. Right. <laughs> it just it, it seal right. The Miami Beach is going to be underwater. James Hansen from NASA predicted that Manhattan would be underwater between 2008 and 2018, lower Manhattan. None of these things happen. And at some point, it's going to start registering with people that just, just quit listening because they keep hearing these predictions of disaster, which never occur. This polar bear is probably the most famous polar bear on the planet. And alarmists were quick to try to make the theory fit. One starving polar bear became the poster of climate change in the Arctic. We don't know if it's starving to death or if it's sick. This video literally stressed friendships of mine because people thought that I was heartless because I'm skeptical whether climate change caused this one polar bear to be starving to death, which goes back to just how cruel nature is. Nature is unforgiving, and if a wild animal becomes injured in the wild, it's a death sentence. So using logic that one starving polar bear must be proof of climate change, what if we turn it around and say a healthy family of polar bears is proof of no climate change? Among the many logical fallacies of climate change alarmism is thinking everything is happening for the first time. For instance, this last summer, there was a major heat wave in Europe. France even hit record temperatures. There were 20 deaths that are somehow attributed to this heat wave. What people don't realize is that in the early 1900s, a heat wave killed thousands of people in Europe. Another example of this thinking is with this shark incident. A shark that normally isn't found in Irish waters was found in Irish waters. That must be climate change. Well, it's not proof of anything other than one shark going somewhere that it normally doesn't go. One of the most despicable things about climate change alarmists is that they weaponize children. This young lady is Greta Thunberg. She's now the poster child of the climate change movement. My name is Greta Thunberg. Despite being all of 16, 16 years old, years she's old. already been nominated for a Sweden, Nobel Peace Prize. And I want you to panic. 
I want you to act as if the house even a climate fire. change activist would have to question whether or not that's really before. fair to somebody who's actually done all of and the work and the research has, into has putting together the climate change model versus giving it to a 16 year old girl who parrots what her parents and her good. teachers and her and other elders in her life tell her to, to preach panic unless you have to She's basically a preacher it's a terrible idea preaching a religion but when let me share with you the story of Irina Sendler who during World War II saved countless children from the Holocaust by smuggling them out of the ghettos and the concentration camps she was actually caught and sentenced to death but managed to get away and the biggest insult of all was to lose a 2007 Nobel Peace Prize to Al Gore. And this just goes to show that when awards are given out for political reasons, it undermines the credibility of the whole institution. The, uh, you're, you're obviously uh, addressing something that you're very seriously concerned about. I, I noted uh, on uh, November 2nd, the Washington Post uh, uh, carried uh, this report. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is warming up, icebergs are growing scarcer, and in some places the seals are finding the water too hot, according to a report to the Commerce Department yesterday. Uh, reports from fishermen, seal hunters, and explorers all point to a radical change in climate conditions and hitherto unheard of temperatures in the Arctic zone. Uh, exploration expeditions report that scarcely any ice has been met as far north as 81 degrees 29 minutes. Soundings to a depth of 3,100 meters showed the Gulf Stream still very warm. Great masses of ice have been replaced by moraines of earth and stones. The report continued. While at many points, well-known glaciers have entirely disappeared. Uh, very few seals and no whitefish are found in the eastern Arctic, while vast shoals of herring and smelts, uh, which have never before ventured so far north, are being encountered in the old seal fishing grounds. Within a few years, it's predicted that uh, due to the ice melt, the sea will rise and make uh, most coastal cities uninhabitable. Is, is this a crisis you're referring to? It is a crisis we're trying to address. And, and, and um, uh, how, how long has this been reaching a critical condition? I'm not sure how you would define a critical condition. I think we are seeing the impacts now, and this guidance uh, is a tool that agencies will be able to use to provide us information on how specifically to, to address the the catastrophic warming that this report refers to. I'm not familiar with that specific report. Well, what I can perhaps tell you the reason is because uh, it was November 2nd, 1922, that the Washington Post carried this article. So here I found a Wikipedia article that lists all of the state temperature extremes, and this links directly to the NOAA website. Their site has other interesting data like rainfall records, but I went ahead and graphed the state temperature extreme records. You can see that the decade that had the most records was the 30s, and that actually correlates well to the Dust Bowl. So we know that the United States had more all-time state heat records broken in the 1930s during the Dust Bowl. But also what's interesting is more cold records were set during that decade as well. If you had to pick a decade to not want to be in the United States, it was the 30s. It was either really hot or really cold. Very few records are actually set since the 1960s. In fact, more cold records have been set indicating that the United States has been getting colder, which is supported by media coverage during the late 70s. And beyond this article, here's unequivocal proof that scientists in the late 70s truly did believe that an ice age was around the corner. This documentary was well watched. It is not only the lonely Arctic that has cooled. The whole northern hemisphere is growing steadily colder. At weather stations in the far north, temperatures have been dropping for 30 years. Sea coasts, long free of summer ice, are now blocked year round. According to some climatologists, within a lifetime, we might be living in the next ice age. In 
1877, the worst winter in a century struck the United States. Arctic cold gripped the Midwest for weeks on end. Great blizzards paralyzed cities of the Northeast. One desperate night in Buffalo, eight people froze to death in marooned cars. Temperatures in the Arctic have fallen dramatically over the last 30 years. In most locations, the drop has been about two degrees centigrade. At that rate, the descent to ice age temperatures could take less than 200 years. Dr. Gifford Miller is a glaciologist from the University of Colorado. He's been studying the climate and glaciers of Baffin Island for the past six years. For the last 3,000 years, the summer temperatures have been getting colder and the amount of precipitation, and rainfall and snowfall has decreased so that the conditions have been drier and colder. And at the same time, uh, the glaciers have expanded in the most recent expansion, which occurred between 300 years ago and the turn of the present century, the glaciers attained their most extensive positions that they had during the last 8,000 years. The summer of 1972 was one of the uh, most severe summers on record, and the ice never melted that summer. And when I returned to Broughton Island, one of the local settlements here, talking to the Inuit people, and they could only tell me that their fathers had told them of a time when the ice hadn't gone out. Uh, almost every year since, uh, we had the uh, I is uh, moving in uh, out of the fjords, uh, so it looks like uh, the climate has changed. It looks like it, it turned colder. If we are unprepared for the next advance, the result could be hunger and death on a scale unprecedented in all of history. If an ice age is coming, what can we do to stop it? Nuclear energy might be used to loosen polar ice caps. Sea ice could be melted by covering it with black soot to increase the absorption of sunlight. So in one decade, ice is thick and undesirable, so soot is an idea to melt it. Then in another decade, they think soot is on the ice and it's melting it, and that's causing a panic. Then a little more observation reveals that it was actually sensors on the satellite, showing again that sometimes we chase results that are test error. One thing I find frustrating is that I don't see a correct differentiation between a melting glacier and a calving glacier. This is what it looks like when ice melts. You'll see that it just stays stationary and slowly melts away without a lot of drama. Melting ice is not particularly exciting to look at. Calving is, but calving is not a melting glacier. In fact, calving is an abundance of ice and what happens is a glacier is actually a slow-moving river. It's basically the same as an avalanche except that it's ice and it's moving very slowly. But what happens is you have an abundance of ice which causes weight to accumulate and then it starts to slide down an incline. As it gets to the coast where it meets seawater, the warmer ocean water will undercut the ice that's coming in above it and the weight of the ice eventually breaks and that's what you see when you see a glacier calve. Calving glaciers are not disappearing glaciers. In fact, they're growing but they can only grow up to the coastline before their own weight causes them to break and fall into the ocean. We're getting ready to head up to the Arctic because that is ground zero for where climate change is happening. And so we are going to be heading up there. And this week, it has been, in fact, this month, we're talking about extreme warmth in Alaska. This is where climate change is happening. We're going to be there. And next week, we'll be live from Alaska, bringing you the latest on what researchers say is an environmental disaster that is rolling on with no end in sight. The folks there in Yukivik may become the first... Uh, climate change refugees wow. in our country because the climate is and the, the, the landscape is changing so quickly. So Anchorage hit 90 degrees Fahrenheit and Al Roker was basically saying that that was a record temperature and for a certain area it very well might have been but was Anchorage breaking 90 degrees really that big a deal? In 2013 parts of Alaska hit 96 degrees. 
I'm actually surprised Anchorage has never hit 90 degrees given how far south it is compared to other parts of Alaska that have hit 90 degrees in the past. The simple fact is that the all-time state heat record for Alaska was set in 1915. It reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit at Fort Yukon. This turned into a pretty embarrassing newscast for Al Roker because he went up there purportedly to show how hot Alaska had gotten and I know that he was going to try and parade in shorts or something to pull a stunt and make a point that Alaska had gotten hot and what had happened was it was basically just a high pressure system that moved in over the Arctic and it trapped heat in what is called a heat dome but it was very temporary it was only for a week or so so Al Roker got up there to show off how hot it was and then, of course, like anything else that happens to people who showboat, nature turned on him and the weather broke and it got very cold. So instead of going there in Bermuda shorts, he ended up having to dress like an Eskimo to do his weather cast to show how hot Alaska was while he was freezing his butt off on live television. Here's classic cherry picking alarmism. In 2019, this picture of dogs walking on water circulated as proof of climate change until... A picture from 1984 surfaced showing the exact same thing. That was a little embarrassing. And here's another example of Arctic cherry picking. We see how bright and white and thick the glaciers supposedly were in 1972 as compared to 2019. Why 1972, one might ask? It's not an even year. It's not 50 years from 2019 to 1972. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that that was a particularly thick year for ice as it was actually mentioned in In Search Of. The summer of 1972 was one of the uh, most severe summers on record and the ice never melted that summer. And when I was talking to the Inuit people and they could only tell me that their fathers had told them of a time when the ice hadn't gone out. Uh, almost every year since, uh, we had the uh, ice uh, moving in and out of the fjords, uh, so it looks like uh, the climate has changed. It looks like it, it turned colder. The gases are predicted to increase the Earth's temperature an average of 2 degrees across the oceans to 8 degrees at the poles in 50 years. The most dramatic effect would be the global flooding that would follow the melting of the glaciers. The rising oceans could cover much of the world's coastal plains, devastating low-lying areas like Charleston. Warmer oceans would spawn more powerful and more frequent tropical storms. Remember that uh, ship that got stuck in the ice? They were looking at global warming. Well, subsequently, a Chinese rescue boat comes along, launches a helicopter. The helicopter gets 52 people off the stuck ship, takes them to an Australian ship. Here's the update. The original Chinese rescue vessel is now stuck in the ice. And it even happened yet again in what was supposedly the warmest July ever recorded a Norwegian icebreaker managed to get itself into trouble going to the Arctic to observe the ice conditions and it was forced to turn back due to overwhelming ice. And even yet again, one more example of a ship full of climate change activists getting itself stuck in the ice while on a mission to go and document how thin the ice has gotten. For almost 200 years, the Northwest Passage has been a promising opportunity for merchants to cut shipping time from Europe to the Pacific. It's the most direct and shortest way and would result in huge cost savings. The first successful complete crossing through the Northwest Passage was in 1906. So it's a mystery how in what is supposedly the hottest summer ever recorded, modern ships are getting themselves stuck in Arctic ice. Prior to 1906 there had been several failed attempts and one of the most famous ones was the Franklin Expedition of 1845. AMC made a miniseries that Netflix streamed, which was named after one of the ships of the Franklin Expedition called the Terror. England, very far away. We've come here to find a way through to China and India. Water was warm enough that the ships were able to sail quite far north, and then... Winter set in, and that winter lasted for years and years, and everybody died because the ships were stuck. Apart from the embarrassment of second-guessing Arctic ice, there have been a couple of other very humorous cases where cherry-picking went wrong. The first one happened in 2017 in Chicago. I even cautioned people who were sounding the climate change alarm bells 
to not get overly excited by the fact that there was no snow in Chicago for one season. While it was a rare occurrence, it really isn't that big of a deal. And another funny part of it was highlighting how concerned the people were about the climate change. <laughs> are, are, you you? Miss, are you missing the snow? No. Why? Looking forward to spring. <laughs> oh, okay. You? <laughs> no. You're not missing not it at all? all? Nope. I'm perfectly fine with this. <laughs> okay. No snow. It's amazing. I mean, we're out here having a good time skating. It's a little, little wet, but hey, I don't miss having to wear five jackets out here. I got on one sweatshirt, and that's what's up. I am not missing the snow. This is great. Flash forward a year later, and guess what? There was a blizzard which was blamed on climate change. So whether it snows or it doesn't snow, you can be sure that if it's extreme, it's going to be blamed on climate change. One of the funniest cherry picking fails happened when the issue of iguanas in Florida came up. And of course, during the summer, when there are no cold parts of Florida, iguanas being reptiles are going to thrive. Wherever it's warm, iguanas are gonna thrive. So the fact that they were spreading all over the place one year is proof of climate change and then of course when there's a cold snap and they all start dying that was blamed on climate change as well and that a cold snap in florida happened for the first time in fact in 1977 that's 41 years ago it snowed in miami and as a refresher to everyone's memory in 1986 nasa had its largest setback to the space program which was the loss of the Space Shuttle Challenger, and that was specifically due to the cold weather acting on the O-rings of the solid rocket boosters. Florida regularly suffers from what's called nuisance flooding, which is a combination of different things including storm surge, as well as slow drainage and outdated pumps. It can even happen during clear skies. Every time there's a video of a flooded street in Florida, people claim that it's climate change, until they're shown pictures from the 60s and even the very early 1900s have historical pictures of clear sky flooding in Florida. So when a reputable climate research institute has its computer server hacked and hundreds of its private emails made public, the news gets around fast, especially from groups that don't believe the global warming consensus. One email attributed to the research center's director had this cryptic excerpt referring to the, quote, trick of adding in the real temps to each series to hide the decline in temperature. That all changed for me in November 2009, following the leaked ClimateGate emails that illustrated the sausage-making and even bullying that went into building the consensus. The ClimateGate incident that Dr. Curry is referring to happened in 2009 when hackers stole several thousand messages off of the email server of the University of East Anglia, which is in England. One of those messages referenced a trick used by Dr. Michael Mann, who was researching a correlation between temperatures and tree rings. The incident was thoroughly investigated and there were no allegations of any improper or illegal activity. The only official criticism was on how data had been handled and shared. The controversy hinges around whether or not scientists are using data to support a predetermined conclusion. What the trick was referring to was substituting actual temperatures for the estimated temperatures from the tree ring graph. On its own, the tree ring graph would have shown a decline in temperatures. However, by substituting in the actual temperatures, they were able to show the graph with an upward hockey stick temperature projection. This is a famous temperature graph. It plots land and ocean temperatures over the last 160 years or so and what you see is a combination of land stations and they started adding in the ocean stations. In this rendition of the temperature graph one can see that the 1.2 degree anomaly was actually plotted and that was in the first quarter of 2017 when they were still anticipating that this record-breaking heat that had never happened before was going to continue on and then of course when it changed directions the graph is never shown with that extent of heating because 
the following years, the drop was so dramatic that it went from 1.2 degrees to 0.8 degrees within three years. And if one were to extrapolate that rate, all of the global warming that's reported would be wiped out in just four more years. This graph is treated as gospel by climate change alarmists, even though its integrity has been called into question. In his video, Is the Global Temperature Record Credible?, Tony Heller asserts that NASA has hidden global cooling from the 1940s to the 1970s, and he even provides published graphs by NASA, and their silence has been deafening. No one has actually challenged Tony Heller on this point. Now here you'll see something that's mutually exclusive, yet it still happens at the same time. This is a temperature chart of the troposphere. The reason this is interesting is because it basically shows almost no change in temperature, while the surface temperature below it has increased supposedly. And why I say that's mutually exclusive is because you can't have a situation where you have the ground heating up and then the air doesn't heat up above it. The heat has to go somewhere. Another issue is that the measurement instruments were very different than what they are now. Where the readouts are digital and utilizing highly accurate lasers to measure temperature from satellites. This NASA slide shows the current weather stations distributed around the world and compared to 1890 you can see that they had very large gaps of coverage mainly in South America and Africa and Russia. So how can anyone say that we've had consistent measurements over time? In no way am I discounting my admiration for scientists in the 1800s who were able to measure the Earth's surface temperatures to within one degree Celsius of what we measure today. But giving their measurements the same weight as measurements that are made in the present day with current methods is not statistically sound. There's also the measurement problems of what's called a heat island effect. It's also called urban heat. That problem occurs where scientists have to be consistent so they can't go moving their weather stations around, but that doesn't stop progress. So a weather station that was in the middle of the forest in one year is now in a Walmart parking lot. And no one denies that that instrument is reading a higher measurement, but is it climate change or is it testing error? Another fallacy is the appeal to authority, which is we're scientists, you're not, we know everything, you don't. And the, a very good question, and this is a very, very solid argument. If your doctor said you have cancer, would you ignore him? I don't think I would ignore a doctor who told me I had cancer, and I certainly wouldn't put my medical knowledge ahead of his. But the counter question to that is, would you take him seriously if he told you that you only had 10 years to live after 40 years? And that's what's happened in this climate change debate. Enough time has passed to where we've been able to test whether the models held up or not. The other fallacy is the lack of predictive theory. And what predictive theory is, is basically how Einstein proved relativity. And what happened was he predicted stars would react a certain way when there was an eclipse. And they took a before picture and an after picture. And you could see the stars shift due to the bending of the fabric of space. That is called predictive theory. He made a prediction and proved it when it came true. Predict that something is going to happen and then declare that you were right. You don't get to go back and look at theories and then try and make a current event fit that. That's how cults work, and we'll get into that later on. Skeptics are often asked, if they don't deny science, then what would it take to convince them that climate change is happening? And most skeptics will admit and stipulate that climates change over time. The way to prove that there's a climate crisis would be to identify canaries in the coal mine. And it's been tried before. Certain islands that were supposed to be underwater, and we've seen all of the predictions that didn't come true. But that's unfortunately the only way to prove that climate change is real and a threat. Some important things to remember are that the canaries have to be healthy. 
at the time that you start the experiment. So there's no cherry picking sick canaries to say that something's making canaries sick and make a long term prediction as to what's going to happen to them. One example that I could come up with as a canary in the coal mine is the Tory pine tree. The Tory pine tree is indigenous to the Tory Pines area of La Jolla, California, and it's found in one other place, which is Santa Rosa Island, a channel island off the coast of California. They're very sensitive to any sort of temperature extreme, and since they're healthy now, we can say that if they all of a sudden aren't healthy, that would be a sign of climate change. We're going to go visit Tory pine trees in a little bit. Another canary in the coal mine, we can think of things that affect the global economy, something that's very visible and would be indisputable. As distasteful as it might be to talk about, if we look at something like the drug trade and the fact that cocaine comes from the coca plant, which is only grown in South America in the Andes Mountains, if all of a sudden coca plants don't grow in the Andes, you're going to see a major disruption to that particular industry. Another big one would be coffee. Coffee is grown in a few areas, but they're big players like Colombia. Colombia grows a lot of coffee. If all of a sudden coffee doesn't grow in Colombia and other places are growing coffee that weren't growing it before, that would be a good canary in the coal mine. The other thing to keep in mind is that we're not talking about one bad harvest or one drought or one flood or whatever it is. NASA defines climates as being weather patterns over the course of about 17 years. So let's go to Torrey Pines and look at some trees. So here we are at Torrey Pines State Preserve, home to the world-renowned Torrey Pine Tree. If some of those NASA scientists or people from NOAA had taken the oceanography class that I took, they would have visited the Torrey Pines Reserve and they would have learned about the Torrey Pine Tree and just how sensitive they are to climate change and the fact that they are still thriving is indicative that there's very little, if any, temperature change in this region anyway. One thing that I noticed today is that it was 96 degrees in Escondido and it's only 80 degrees here. So the interface between the land and the ocean provides a very stable temperature and that's why these trees can only survive in this area. They only grow within about five miles of here and in one of the Channel Islands. If they are moved beyond that they don't survive. There are some people who manage to get them to grow in their yards. It takes a lot of attention and care. So they need a very stable temperature range. And that's why I call them the canary, because they would be one of those first species that you would notice the effects of climate change on. You'll notice the pine trees do have pine cones. So they are just regular pine trees, but they're kind of dwarfed. And that has to do with their environment. They're spread out and so they have plenty of room. They don't need to grow particularly tall to get enough sunlight and they get more than enough moisture from the marine layer that always keeps this place humid. I call them nature's bonsai. It's a little term of affection for them. I think they're very picturesque because they look like bonsai trees. These windblown bluffs are a feature of what's called a chaparral habitat. This particular topography is known for its coastal sage scrub and the cliffs that you see here. I have an open challenge to anybody on the internet, and I have made it for years, for somebody to please show me a before and after picture of sea level rise. No one including NASA, has been able to do so. So this sea level rise, I would put in the realm of cryptozoology because the only things that seem to be more averse to having their picture taken are Bigfoot, UFOs, ghosts, and the Loch Ness Monster. Here's the latest satellite data from NASA graphing global sea level. It's part of a larger graph based on tidal gauges which measured sea level from the late 1800s. It shows very constant rising year after year, and that translates out to about two to three millimeters a year. To make that meaningful to most Americans who don't like the metric system, if we take a century as being 100 years and multiply it times that rate, it translates out to be between three quarters of a foot to a foot per century. And I thought that's interesting. Plymouth Rock, after 400 years, is still basically dry when it should be under up to four feet of water. So how could that be? So I found a graph 
that covers roughly 2,500 years. And you can see that, as usual, we're being given cherry-picked data to show the largest increase in sea level. According to this graph, the date that's inscribed on Plymouth Rock, and present day, sea level has risen about 10 centimeters, which is all of 4 inches. I wanted to talk about Venice, Italy, but decided against using it as an example because the city is actually sinking. But I found it interesting that today there was a published article, the tides in Venice, Italy are almost to record levels. And then that begs the question, well, the prior record was set in 1966. So over the course of my entire lifetime, which supposedly encompasses the greatest impact on sea level rise by human beings, I have never seen the tide actually break a record in Venice, Italy. When I post photographic comparisons of seashore landmarks, the main objection that I get is people are concerned that the photos aren't consistent because of forces that act on tides on a daily basis. And I think that's a fair criticism. But there's ways to get around that. And we can look for little clues besides just the water level that tell us what the tidal range is on a daily basis. And the first way that I found to do this is to look at life that exists in and around the tidal zone and the splash zone. And you can see, for instance, with barnacles, that they will only grow to a certain height on a pillar that might be part of a wharf or a pier. So if you were to look at two comparison photos and see barnacles living higher than they did in other photos, you might be able to say that that sea level rise. And it's the same thing with vegetation. Now here on this slide, you'll see that Normandy Beach, the site of D-Day. Here you can see what it looked like in 1944 and a present day picture. You'll note that the vegetation line is exactly in the same place as it's always been. And this line is what would denote the high water line. At certain interfaces, vegetation will grow up to where the water comes up to. Now the water may come up a little higher on a really high tide or whatever, and it's not enough to kill the vegetation off. But if we were to keep everything consistent, one could speculate that if the water rises, the vegetation will also recede and the other way around. If the water level lowers, the vegetation will grow to fill in that spot. The second method I came up with was to look for the impression that water makes on sand as tides rise and fall. One thing people that live on the beach will know very well is that when the tide comes in, it smooths everything out and makes a basically a nice blank slate. And even when the water goes to low tide, that slate is still left there because you'll see a nice line of where the water came up to the footprint. The third method is by looking for staining. Water has a corrosive effect, especially salt water, on concrete and rocks and other hard surfaces. So you can see where the water line fluctuates with tides. I was on the NASA climate change site and someone was informing me that the water level in Florida has risen a foot in the last decade, and I was getting some blowback from NASA, who considers everything I write on their page to be off topic. But it was a little embarrassing, I think, to them to show them a picture of Cocoa Beach, which is in their backyard, that I happened to take from my drone in 2016 and comparing it to a vintage image of Cocoa Beach from probably the early 60s. Keep in mind, the burden of proof is on those asserting sea level rise, not on the skeptic. And even though I've produced photos showing little or no sea level rise, I'm still waiting for somebody to show me a picture of sea level rise. You can live in comfort with good food and warm clothing, women as you desire them, allowed to pursue your studies of philosophy and history. I would enjoy debating with you. You have a keen mind. What must I do? Nothing, really. Tell me how many lights you see. How many? How many lights? There are four lights. There are five lights. How many do you see now? You cannot hurt me! 
How many? Sur le pont de Davignon. One of the most disappointing aspects of climate change theory is morphing science into a religion. There are so many similarities to the climate change talking points in religious theocracy. For one thing, they both have preachers. Right, you have climate change scientists and then you have religious leaders such as the Pope and the priests and the bishops and all of that. You have the similarities in the message. You have a predetermined conclusion on the message. On the religious side you have the Bible which is going to tell you everything you need to know about the world and your existence. And on the other hand you have the climate change model. This model that we've heard so much about, where human beings are pumping out greenhouse gases that are trapping the heat in, heating the world up, and that's going to lead us to some dire consequences. So both have a set of rules to live by. That's how you control the masses. Both religion and climate change pseudoscience have sacrifices and offerings. In ancient times, the Aztecs used to sacrifice people if there was a bad harvest, and the thinking was if they sacrificed enough people and made offerings to the gods, that the gods would have mercy and bless them with a good crop harvest. With climate change religion, you have the same superstition, which is if we don't do something the climate change boogeyman is going to do something. So our offering is to reduce carbon. If something costs more, people buy less of it. Safety glasses off. That's it. Okay, safety glasses on. When we release carbon, say by burning coal or driving an SUV, all of us pay for that in the form of things like fires, floods, and crop failures. Putting a fee on carbon creates incentives to emit less carbon. And more importantly, it also incentivizes the development of low carbon technology, which is huge because that's vital to reducing emissions globally. They are some of the most popular and flashy TV There's never a shared sacrifice. You have commercial. the preachers with their Learjets. How much money did you pay for Tyler Perry's Gulfstream jet, for example? Well, for example, that's really none of your business. He made that airplane so cheap for me, I couldn't help but buy And you have the climate elitists with their Learjets. This week, countless celebrities are flying private jets to Italy for a Google-run summit called Google Camp. It's in Sicily. It's a secret summit. And the top item on the agenda? Global warming. There are many similarities between religious cults and climate change alarmists. They both have a doomsday prediction. The Bible says that the world will end through revelations. Climate change science, well, according to the IPCC, we only have 12 years to go before the world reaches a tipping point. Nothing can be done after that, and so the world is doomed. The only thing missing from climate change pseudoscience are biblical plagues and pestilence. Oh, for crying out loud, will they even have that? Climate science and religion have their ways of keeping people in line. In religion, if you don't follow the Bible, you're going to go to hell. Or the Quran, or whatever religion, there's always a downside to not following the religion. If you were to actually get a preacher to admit that the Bible has inconsistencies in it, he'd probably lose his livelihood. In climate science, it's the same thing. If a scientist were to change their minds, such as Dr. Judith Curry, or Dr. Patrick Moore. They were both kicked out of their organizations for questioning the consensus on climate change. 
Moore actually helped get Greenpeace up and running in Canada and even served as their president. Now Greenpeace tries to discredit him by claiming that he's not an original founding member. And the evidence that they have for this is this letter, which is A, clearly referencing his desire to join their very first expedition. And B, you can see by the letterhead that the organization was actually still transitioning to become Greenpeace. The claim is malicious in the fact that their own website listed more as a founder. People who disagree with climate change science are shunned. They're called deniers. They're called Trump tards. They're given psychological diagnosis. They're compared to flat earthers and anti-vaxxers. A very serious logical fallacy there. Assuming that somebody believes something else just because they believe something that you don't agree with. They're even called heretics. You call President Trump a, a, a heretic. To reality. reality. To reality. Her heretic to reality. You know, as, as, a, as, a, as a raised Catholic, um, you know, the, the greatest sin is, is actually heresy. Because not only do you, um, are not, not only are you astray from the right path, you're inviting, you're encouraging other people to come with you on that path. So specifically, heresy is like prophetizing for the devil. And the punishment for heretics is sort of the most extreme. I think it's right. red hot iron coffins. And then, of course, you have the inquisitions and the trial by tribulation. All of that good stuff also applies to climate science. In fact, they've even coined a term ecogenocide, where if they had their way, they would actually start putting people on trial for not adopting their agenda. They would be tried for crimes against humanity in The Hague. You can't put somebody on trial for a crime that hasn't happened. And you can't put somebody on trial for just believing something that you don't agree with. It's a very skewed and warped paradigm that these people are operating on. So I expect that there'll be criticism on the implication that Stephen Colbert and Anderson Cooper were laying a moral justification for killing the President of the United States. I would totally understand the skepticism, but I've heard Stephen Colbert numerous times ridicule President Trump for not believing in man-made climate change. But this is a dangerous side of liberalism. We're seeing the real side of Stephen Colbert and Anderson Cooper. And Stephen Colbert hid behind his religion to not make the assertion himself, but he was clearly making the case that his religion would condone the killing of the President of the United States, and Anderson Cooper was right along with him feeding into it. I get it, it seems far-fetched. It's not like an American president has ever been killed by an entertainer. Oh yeah, it happened. This is where I'm very suspicious of people who claim to be benevolent liberals. They aren't, and we're seeing the dark side of their belief system in this video. And a lot of really horrible people have used that same logic and caused a tremendous body count because their ideology all of a sudden became more important than human life. Anderson Cooper distanced himself from Kathy Griffin when she held up the picture of Trump's severed head. Even though he disavowed what she did, that it's not that much of a stretch for his belief system to condone killing the President of the United States as well. All of these horrible people have several things in common. They all espouse a socialist structure where people plan and determine what is enough for everyone else to have, even though they don't live by the same rules. And people like these and some other truly evil people in the world mask a very dark side behind charming personalities. Chairman Mao Zedong was a gentle guy. Dennis Rodman described Kim Jong-un as humble. Hitler was known as a very gracious host. Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi had extremely generous government programs to their citizens. Free education and free college and free health care, the whole bit. All of the promises that socialists promise until somebody has a problem with how their lives are being run. And then all of a sudden, their lives are not as important as the master plan or the end goal. Another thing they have in common Many of them like to hide behind children. When people use children, that gives them an excuse to promote an ideology that is above being questioned because who would question a child? Children are innocent, and that's what these people exploit. 
Hitler had the Hitler Youth Corps. Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi had young armies. ISIS resorted to using children. The RUF in Africa used children in the Sierra Leone Civil War. Pol Pot was very likable by many accounts, and the Khmer Rouge used mainly children to commit atrocities because children are shapeable and they don't question adults who are in charge. If there's one takeaway that I want viewers of my film to see, it's that I want children to realize that their future is not guaranteed either way. And what these people are doing have literally condemned children to death row. All children nowadays believe that they're on death row and telling children that they only have 12 years to live because their death is a certainty is psychological abuse. And it is my hope that this film will actually set some minds free and influence people into understanding that they have more of a chance of prosperity and happiness than any generation who's come before them. By every measure, the world is safer and better than it has ever been. If you're watching this film, I would make the bold prediction that it's very unlikely that you will ever starve to death. That is, unless you move into Nancy Pelosi's district. Then there's no guarantees. When I look at the world that I live in, I don't see a dying planet by any means. I actually find it perplexing that people find reasons to say that the Earth is dying when there's no signs of it dying. I see life all over the place thriving, and animals that were endangered are thriving now. This last year we had tremendous rainfall in Southern California, and this rainfall was really useful in showing how the ecosystem adapts and depends on weather variability. We had a lot of rain. Desert blooms in California are normal, but we had a super bloom to where the city of Lake Elsinore was having to turn tourists away. I noticed on hikes that the rainfall had caused water to stand where it normally doesn't, and I filmed these tadpoles that I don't normally see in Southern California, and because the rainfall had caused the water to stand, it was obvious to me that it was a trigger for frogs to lay their eggs and for the tadpoles to hatch. This is normal in nature. The wildlife has evolved to live within its ecosystem and disruptions can cause extinctions. That is a normal course of life. There are some real environmental challenges that we are facing. The real problems involve real pollution. Plastic pollution is a real problem. You don't have to be an alarmist, you just have to be a good steward to recognize that dumping plastic in the ocean isn't a good idea. So here's the big reveal about me. I actually drive electric cars, not because I'm worried about global warming, but because I care about pollution. Burning gasoline is not healthy. No one is going to convince me that a city with a bunch of gasoline cars has better air quality than a city full of electric cars. No one is going to convince me that burning fossil fuels and importing foreign oil is a good idea. So I do believe in solar. I'm a big fan of renewables. To the extent that we're developing new technologies and preserving quality of life for as many citizens as we can. Passing carbon taxes so that we don't have traffic on our freeways is elitism at its worst. Technology has led to people being able to have a high standard of living while having a minimal impact on the environment. Future technologies that are right around the corner promise an even higher standard of living and even cleaner living. And these improvements aren't brought around by radical environmentalism. And what people need to do is learn how to decouple alarmism with good stewardship. No one says it's okay to pollute people's drinking water or contaminate the air that they breathe, but chasing carbon dioxide as some sort of culprit to man's woes is reckless. Mm -hmm.